thanks again for coming. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm Erin. And then we're in the conservation leadership through learning program with CSU. We're gonna we're in Belize for six months, so we're gonna show you a bit about what we learned while we were there. And just a quick outline of what we're gonna be doing. We'll have an introduction, methods. We're just gonna touch the tip of the iceberg with results and show you some of the highlights that we found. And then some lit review and discussion recommendations. And then there's always lessons learned whenever you do projects like this. We have a lot of those. So any great project requires a great team. And we were so fortunate to work with our friends Max, Lee, Jen as our advisor, and ourselves and our two research assistants, Everista and Jose. I don't know if you can do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we created a visual key because we'll have uh, three themes that will be interwoven throughout our presentation and hopefully this will help you keep track of what we're talking about. One of those themes is the community's level of exposure to tourism. So we have communities that have had little to, or one community that has had little to no exposure to tourism, one community that has had some, and one community that has had the most exposure of tourism out of three. And so you'll see these symbols that kind of indicate their level of exposure. Welcome. <laughs> and we'll also be talking about vision um, in relation to uh, our non-governmental organization and the communities. And when we talk about vision, there will be an I symbol. And then we'll be talking about factors that contribute to participation in tourism. And so those factors are motivation, opportunity, and ability. And you'll see those symbols delineating when we talk about that. So hopefully that'll help you keep track. And now just some background context. We're going to talk about a bit the socio-ecological context there. So again, we were in Belize. Uh, it's a Central American country between Mexico and Guatemala there, and then the Caribbean Sea to the east. Uh, it's about the size of Massachusetts, so it's pretty small. There's about uh, 330,000 people there, which isn't very many. Um, and so there's also a good amount of, of tourists that come there because of all the diversity. Uh, there's ecological diversity. It has the second longest barrier reef. And it also has the highest percentage of forest cover in Central America. So lots of cool creatures to see in the forest. And then the cultural diversity is also really incredible. There's over six major ethnic groups, including Mestizos, Mayans, Garifuna. There's a lot of Mennonites there. Um, and then if you remember, this is the size of Massachusetts. It's pretty incredible how diverse it is. And so you can see uh, there's a good amount of tourists that come overnight. Uh, this is from 2012, so that's a higher number now. And there's definitely a lot of cruise tourists that come. Um, you can see they come to the north up there. We, however, were in the south in the Toledo district. This is the poorest district, and it has the fewest number of people. It's often referred to as the forgotten district, because uh, they say the government doesn't provide them the, the help that they need. Uh, so we were based down there, and it also has the fewest number of tourists there. Just 2% of the tourists that go to Belize go to the Toledo district. But there's still lots to see there. Some of you have probably heard of the Blue Hole. Uh, so a lot of people go to visit this and go scuba diving. There's awesome snorkeling. There's uh, the Maya archaeological sites that are really great to see, and lots of people go like zip lining. There's a countless number of things to, to do there. And tourism is growing in Toledo, even though tourists don't go there very often right now. Norwegian Cruise Line is currently building a port just north to the district, and they're planning to have excursions that go to the Maya communities there. They're starting to make contracts with communities there. Uh, and then there's a National Sustainable Tourism Master Plan that was created and approved by the government. So they're planning to invest a good amount of money into developing tourism there for purposes of alleviating poverty. And then there's also a sustainable tourism program, which is a proposed loan by the Inter-American Development Bank. And they have a specific focus on developing tourism areas, which includes Toledo. And then finally, there's also a road connection with Guatemala. They're repaving a road there, and that's they think that will also bring some more tourists in through that way. There's quite a bit going on for Toledo, and it's definitely going to grow in the future tourism lines. Zooming in a little bit, this is the area where we worked in the Maya Golden Landscape. It's a really diverse area here. There's hundreds of different species of trees and birds. There's jaguars in there. So it's a really cool area. 
And there's lots of Hispanic and Maya communities. You can see these are mostly all Maya communities kind of interwoven in and in, in between the, the protected areas there. Uh, a lot of the Maya communities here are subsistence-based farmers. Uh, they live in traditional style huts. They, many don't have electricity. Uh, don't have electricity, don't have plumbing. Um, so they're, they're pretty basic out there. And then the cruise ship you can see is going to be over there. So they're going to have some excursions coming in through here. Okay. And then these are the three communities that we worked with. So up here we have Medina Bank, Golden Stream, and Indian Creek. Um, and then the cruise ship has planned excursions to places in Golden Stream and Indian Creek here. Just a little bit about the communities. They're relatively small. The biggest one just has 170 households. And then talking about the level of tourism. Medina Bank used to have a guest house in the 90s, but tourists didn't go there very often, and then termites took it over and they since have burned it down. Uh, so they currently don't have any tourism there. In Golden Stream, there's an expat owned spice farm that tourists go to visit, um, but they don't really go into the community after that. And then there's a women's group there, but it's kind of semi-functioning. And then Indian Creek has the highest level of tourism. They have a uh, Maya archeological site that a lot of people go to visit. There's four women's groups that are fairly well established. And then until 2012, there was a high-end lodge there, but the employees were unpaid, and they've since burned it down. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of burning and burning. <laughs> so delve, to delve more into our project and introduce our partnering organization, we had the absolute pleasure and privilege to work with Yashe Conservation Trust through the connection with Jen. And uh, Yashay Conservation Trust is a Belizean non-governmental organization um, focuses on conservation and sustainable community development. They've been around since 1997. Um, they work in protected area management and encouraging sustainable livelihoods with the farmers in the Maya communities around the Maya Golden Landscape. And if you're from, oh, they're mission, sorry. Well, if you're familiar, <laughs> If you're familiar with the nonprofit world, um, it's very hard to come by funds, especially for operational costs. So Yashay found itself trying to figure out a sustainable funding mechanism to, uh, to fund their protected area management. And they came up with a social enterprise, Ecotourism Belize. This is their social enterprise arm. And uh, this, um, this idea will hopefully help them raise money for their conservation efforts. The vision behind Ecotourism Belize is number one, like I said, to raise funding for protected area management. It's also to protect, um, promote sustainable livelihoods. So we have farming villages um, that are often seen engaging in agricultural practices that may not be conducive to the health of the surrounding protected areas. And so offering them other livelihoods will help um, hopefully reduce that, in, that pressure on those protected areas. And then the uh, third vision, which we'll be focusing on throughout our presentation, is promoting sustainable tourism development. And this diagram helps you, hopefully helps you understand a little bit about how Ecotourism Belize will work. It's a website that you could go to, you too can book a tour. Um, and previously, or if you can imagine these communities are along a road and they don't have electricity, a lot of them don't have access to internet, they don't have any way to market a tourism operation if they have one. Um, their only ability really is to put a sign on the road and hope that tourists will stop and say, hey, this looks interesting and go in. And, and needless to say, some communities receive very few visitors. Um, so using Yashay's notoriety, their name, they have lots of volunteers. Um, people from the comfort of their own home can go see what tours are available in these communities, book a tour, they provide the marketing service, and communities are able to receive more clients. And, and then Yashay also envisions themselves um, providing capacity building to the communities. So they charge a higher price and a smaller um, fee goes to the communities to pay for their services and the profits go to conservation. All right, so now a little bit about what we actually did while we were there. 
So our overarching objective was to inform ecotourism Belize's future tourism development strategies by understanding local Maya perceptions of tourism through the application of social science research. So yeah, Shay is interested in getting involved with tourism, but a first step is knowing if the communities are, are if they want to be involved. And then we really want to commend yeah, Shay for being proactive about this. There's really few studies that have been done in developing countries on awareness and perceptions of tourism, and very few studies done at the early stages of tourism before it's been happening or at the very early stages. So, And then there's little that's been done with like qualitative methods. So they're being very proactive and wanting to have this done. So to get a little more specific about what we looked at, uh, kind of an overarching theme that we looked at was motivation. Do these communities want to participate in tourism? So one aspect of that is perceptions. What do they think about it? What do they think are the costs and benefits of it? And then another aspect is interest. So if they know about it, are they interested in it? Do they want to work in tourism? And if they do, what do they want it to look like? What type of activities would they like to do? And then another aspect was ability. Um, so are they aware of tourism? Do they really know what it means? And then another aspect is capacity. So if they know about it, are they able to do it? Do they have the resources to be able to do that? And again, some of this fits in with, with their vision for how they want it to look in the future. So we, we did a lot of surveys uh, in the three communities. Uh, in Indian Creek, the one with the highest level of tourism, we tacked on a shorter version of our survey to one that was already being done. So they didn't want to have survey fatigue and have them over survey. So we did a smaller version there. And then we did most of the households in uh, the other two communities. It was 90% of the households and 94%. So we had a really high, high response rate there. And then for the two communities that we focused on, we alternated between male and female heads of households. But the other survey was mostly male heads of households because they're focused on, on farmers there. We also did a lot of focus groups. We had some with men, we had some with women, and then we had one with combined youth to get their perspective since they weren't represented in the survey. We also did semi-structured interviews. We met with a lot of the community leaders and then people that are already involved in tourism. And we've done some literature reviews. And here's a, a, a breakdown of some of the demographics in the two communities that we focused on. We had a pretty equal representation from men and women. Uh, so that was great. And then you can see over here the level of education. It's primarily primary school education. And then under that is no education. So we're really working with relatively uneducated communities, which can speak to some of the challenges of, of doing surveys and research there. And then again, things are a little bit different in, in Indian Creek. And then where, what do they do for work? What is their primary source of income? A lot of them are farmers, a lot of them job out, which means that they work outside of the community, but a lot of these are doing farming related things like working on banana farms or citrus farms there. And then you can see here that the tourism is pretty low. Just one person in Medina Bay works in tourism, and then up to nine people in Indian Creek have tourism as their primary source of income. Now for the results. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, looking at their motivation to participate in tourism, wanted to know how are they interested? And overwhelmingly, the communities are interested in participating in tourism. The asterisk by Indian Creek denotes because it was a different survey, a shorter survey, we ended up only asking people who hadn't previously participated in tourism that they were interested. So we assume that that um, percentage would be higher with the people that have already participated in tourism. Needless to say, still um, remembering the exposure level with these communities to tourism, the community with the least amount of exposure to tourism had the most interest, and the Fisher's Exact um, test showed a significant difference between Medina and Golden Stream. So Medina Bank was more likely to respond with, with interest, but overwhelmingly, they are interested. And why are they interested? Oops. Um, one woman said, I don't know, it's just because that I don't have a job, and that is why I would like to work in tourism. And so employment and jobs were um, an overriding reason for interest in working in tourism. And then reasons for not working, wanting to work in tourism was, I can't work even if I would like to because I'm also ill. So maybe they're not physically able. 
and because I have a child to look after and also my family, besides I'm not interested in tourism, that they have obligations to their family. And so between Medina, um, between the communities, we only had, or Medina Bank and Indian um, Creek, we only had nine people say that they were not interested and seven implied that they weren't physically capable for some reason. Only two said that they weren't interested at all. So we really have a high level of interest in these communities. All right, so they're interested in, in tourism, but what do they know about it? Um, what are their perceptions of it? So a lot of you are familiar with the Likert scale that range, ranges from strongly agree to strongly disagree and neutral in the middle. So we did a modified version of that where we provided them with statements and asked them if they agreed or disagreed with that. Here we, we kind of simplified it a bit. So we just have, do they agree, neutral or disagree, these three different categories. And then the colored percentage represents the category that they responded most frequently in. Does that make sense? So here are a few examples of it. Uh, we have tourism would bring more good things than bad things. In Medina Bank with, the, with no tourism there, every single person said that they agreed with the statement. And then the majority of people in Golden Stream also agreed with this statement, but it was to a lesser extent. And then we had similar results with tourism would provide enough income to support your family. So they agreed with positive statements like these. And then we also had some, some statements that implied something negative about tourism, such as tourism would bring more trash to your community. The majority of people in Medina Bank disagreed with this statement, so they don't think that tourism will bring trash to their community. And the majority of people in Golden Stream said this as well, but again, to a lesser extent. And then uh, tourism would increase crime in your community. We had similar results with that. Um, it was half of the people in Golden Stream uh, disagreed with this, and then the other two were split between agree and neutral. Seem a bit of a theme here. <laughs> Some other things that were interesting, uh, we one of the statements was tourism would bring jealousy to your community. Uh, the majority of people in Medina Bank were neutral about this one, and the majority of people in Golden Stream agreed with this, that tourism would bring jealousy. And then tourism would only benefit a few people in your community. We also had similar results with that. Then as we go through this, we'll, we'll kind of see a theme of, of jealousy in here as well. So overall, they had a, a positive um, view of tourism, and we wanted to see if they're aware of the good things in tour or bad things that tourism can bring. Um, this was actually asked before those Likert, that Likert scale in the survey. Um, I have a heavy finger. <laughs> so if anyone is familiar with the word cloud, the bigger, the larger the word, the more responses we had to that word or that idea, and what are the good things that tourism bring? Most, a lot of, most people said income, employment, which is also related. Um, there's a theme of knowledge, exchange, and education. And then we also had a lot of people that said they just don't know. And what I want you guys to write, uh, realize about this screen is um, the variety of responses that are on the screen compared to the next. So what are the bad things that tourism bring? The big don't know and pick nothing, <laughs> and very few other responses. And uh, we thought this was really interesting and wanted to delve deeper into the don't know and nothing responses. In Medina Bank, the community with the least amount of exposure to tourism, only two, or everyone responded don't know or nothing except two people. One person said illness can be brought by tourists, and another mentioned jealousy, which is a cultural phenomenon that we encountered in the communities. Compared to Indian Creek, um, with a greater exposure, only 50% of their respondents said don't know or nothing. The variety that we saw in that slide was from Indian Creek. So overall, they're fairly unaware or unexposed of tourism that could affect their ability to participate. So um, one of the good, things that people mentioned is the exchange of ideas with us in the community and teach tourists our culture. Once again, that exchange, um, learning on both sides. Um, one of the bad things that people mentioned, people envying other people because of better job for one person. Uh, in the Maya communities, there's really like a push to have everyone at the same level. Someone rises, that creates tension within the community. 
and referring to the title of our presentation, the idea that they only take out pictures and nothing more. So tourists just come and they take pictures and cameras don't do damage. You know, the tourists have no harm. But if you're familiar with, um, or as you can imagine, or being a tourist yourself, there are um, impacts associated with tourism. All right, so then we also address capacity, or do they have the capacity to, to work in tourism if they are interested, which relates to ability. So we provided them with a list of common barriers to tourism, and then we asked them if yes, would this be a barrier, or no, would that not be a barrier? And we found that the most frequently one that they responded yes, will be a barrier is financial resources and training. So almost everyone said that yes, those are barriers. And then with the ones that they said yes to, we asked them to rank them. So what's what's the biggest barrier? What's the second biggest barrier? And then lack of financial resources came out on top there. The biggest hurdle to overcome. And then addressing this new development of cruise ship tourism, um, we also looked at their ability and motivation in regards to cruise, the cruise ship tourism. And uh, so, uh, you know, are they aware? Have you heard of cruise ship tourism? And uh, once again, we have that uh, the exposure of tourism kind of influencing how they respond, uh, their, their awareness. And Medina Bank was more likely to be unaware compared to Indian Creek, which was the most aware. Um, and Golden Stream fell right in the middle. So there's still a lot of people that don't quite know what cruise ship tourism is, and we had to provide a picture of a cruise ship to kind of communicate the idea show that it wasn't a big kayak. Yeah. <laughs> the, the words, the words tourist, tourism, cruise ship do not exist in the languages we were dealing with. We were dealing with two languages and these words do not exist. Um, and so th of those that are aware, <laughs> were aware of cruise ship tourism and knew what it was and it, um, understood that was a big kayak that carried thousands of people. <laughs> uh, the overwhelming, over almost 90% of um, respondents said yes. We want this to come to our community. We want, you know, we're interested in engaging with this. And one very enlightened response that we had, um, which wasn't common with the cruise ship tourism, was there are times it is good, but there are companies that gain all the benefits on it, and the village gets nothing. So that kind of like mixed. Um, feelings about cruise ship tour tourism, which is reflected in the literature uh, on cruise ship tourism in the area. All right. So now we know a bit about Yashay's vision and what they want to do with ecotourism police, but equally important is the community vision. So they, they want tourism, what do they want it to look like? The community. So the lovely, talented Aaron drew these different pictures representing different stages of tourism development. So it ranges from no tourism, where the community looks a lot like it does now, all the way to high levels of tourism, we call this the Disneyland level. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's lots of groups, large groups, there's buses coming in, restaurants, chocolate tour, there's, there's people everywhere. So then we, we asked them, which of these scenarios would you prefer to see in your community? And we found very, very little people preferred the lower levels, which we found pretty surprising. There's just one person that likes the community as it is right now. The higher levels, the majority of people in Medina Bank preferred moderate level of tourism, and the majority of people, about three quarters of them in Golden Stream, preferred Disneyland. <laughs> and we did a, a chi-square and we, we excluded the lower ones and we found that these two were significantly, statistically significantly different in their responses, which reflects the level of tourism there. So they want tourism there, they want a lot of it, but how do they think it should be implemented? Should it be just a few people in the community, such as tour guides? Should it be a group within the community, like a women's group? Or should the whole community be involved? And we found hardly anyone thinks that just it should be individually individuals. And the majority of people in Medina <coughs> Bank think it should be a group within the community. And the majority of people in Golden Stream think the whole community should be involved. And we also found that they were specifically <coughs> different in their responses. Some examples of what people said. It's better to involve the whole community so that everyone benefits from it. And another person said so that everyone has a say and a part to play. Then we also asked them who should benefit. 
Medina Bank was a little different in their responses. So the majority of people said they think a group in the community should implement it, but a few of them said that, well, the whole community should benefit from it, but they were kind of split between that. And then in Golden Stream, the majority of people say the whole community should benefit. And again, they were statistically different in their responses. Some examples. So that no one can say that the other benefits more than the others. And so that jealousy can't happen. So again, this, this theme of jealousy that we're seeing. So we, and then we asked them, should anyone from outside the community help develop tourism? The majority of people said yes. We should have help from outside. And then a good amount of them said don't know, but very, very few people said no, we can, we can do it ourselves. And then where should that help come from? Uh, we gave them kind of different examples of where support could come from. Uh, most of them did not think it should come from the private sector. And then they were kind of split on if it should come from the government or a non-governmental organization. But this can also speak to opportunity. So right now with Yashin Ecotourism Belize, they might be more likely to get support from an NGO than they would the government. Okay. So now that we understand the community's perceptions of tourism, we're gonna look at some frameworks and models in tourism literature to help give that some context. Um, it'll help us understand the significance of our results and give a structure to our recommendations for Yashin. And so, as we mentioned before, Yashay's, uh, one of Yashay and Ecotourism's vision is promoting sustainable tourism <coughs> development um, for these communities. And well, what is sustainable tourism? Um, the UN World Trade Organization defines um, sustainable tourism with three elements that um, has an environment, social, social, cultural, and economic um, impact. Um, it conserves the environment. Um, protects uh, biodiversity um, while also conserving the culture of the and, and promoting the culture of the local communities and uh, has socioeconomic benefits that are equi equitably distributed amongst all the stakeholders. Um, there are many strategies um, to sustainable tourism. Ecotourism is one, as I imagine some of you have heard, and that's more of a nature based tourism um, where education is also a theme. And then there's community-based tourism, which is another strategy. And community-based tourism is kind of a bottom or a bottom um, up strategy where communities have power and say in the decision-making process, and there's an equitable equitable distribution of benefits amongst community members. So you can have a community-based tourism project that is also an ecotourism project that's nature-based. And uh, Literature identifies three parameters to community-based tourism, which we'll be focusing on, which are power and control. If the community has the power and control to make decisions, that they participate, and that there's equitable outcomes. And Mayaka has a definition that kind of brings this all together, that community-based tourism is conceptualized as tourism within a given community that facilitates levels of community participation provides desired outcomes in which members exercise power and control. And so to understand um, more the importance of participation and power and control in community-based tourism, um, it's quite frequently stated that participation is a key element of success in community-based tourism projects. Um, if you don't have participation, um, it may jeopardize uh, the, the viability of the project. And participation and power and control together shape key outcomes. Um, they may not decide what the outcomes are, but it contributes to that equitable distribution. And um, in order for communities or, or um, citizens to have, have uh, a say in, in what happens for their future, um, it needs to be meaningful participation. And this requires a redistribution of power. That power has to be given to the community so that they're not just sharing their idea, but then they don't get to have a say in what the decision is. Once again, power, um, participation, power, and control contribute to outcomes. Um, and Hunt and Strong bring this together with uh, the scholarship on sustainable tourism indicates that increased involvement, experience, and participation. Um, in, in ecotourism projects leads to more favorable outcomes 
and attitudes towards tourism. And so to understand the levels of power control and participation, um, referring to Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation, which was created in 1969, but is still used today. Even I found a paper published 2016 that refers to this ladder. It's very um, highly re regarded. And uh, essentially, um, at the bottom of this ladder, this describes different levels of participation of power. At the bottom of this ladder, citizens have no uh, power, no participation. As you go up, you increase tokenism. The three rungs in the middle um, is when commu um, communities or citizens are able to participate, but they, do, they still don't have power, so it's not meaningful participation. Meaningful participation occurs on the top three rungs, starting with partnership, in which uh, communities or citizens are able to not only participate, but have a control in shaping their future. And to understand what factors contribute to where people are on this ladder, um, we looked at the motivation, opportunity, and ability model for community participation in tourism by Hung, Sirakaya, Turk, and Ingram. In Ingram. And, uh, and this really reflects, um, or will refer a lot back to our results. Um, so the first uh, component, um, or this model states that there's three parameters that contribute to participation. And the first parameter is motivation, uh, which is really just their, their, um, their, their interest um, to participate. And it's often decided by um, kind of this aware, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, a weighing of costs and benefits. And so do they see that the costs or the benefits outweigh the costs? And social exchange theory really helps un us understand the motivation aspect. So Anna's gonna explain that for a moment. So as Erin alluded to, uh, social exchange theory is commonly cited in, in tourism literature. And essentially, it's looking at the benefits and impacts. So this it doesn't have to be just economic. It often is. But it could also be sociocultural or environmental. And there's case studies of tourism having all these different types of, of benefits or impacts. It can go either way. And so the idea is if the benefits outweigh the impacts, then residents will have a positive attitude of tourism. And then by extension, then they could be motivated to participate in it. But that makes sense. Then something to consider, um, most of the research shows that a lot of the benefits are economic and then a lot of the costs are, are social or environmental. Again, there's cases that go both ways. Uh, Grissoy and Ruther Rutherford um, have this quote. They say, the more residents feel the economy needs improvement, the more likely they are to support tourism and the less likely they are to be troubled by any social costs. A caveat, though, is this was done in rural Colorado, and then now we're working in Belize. And a lot of the people did, did mention benefits. A lot of people say, yeah, we want jobs, we don't have any money. But then a lot of people also mentioned culture a lot. Culture came up very frequently, and then they also said that they really value the, the environment and they, they depend a lot on it. So it really depends on where their values are to what they deem as most appropriate or most important. Another framework that's frequently cited in the tourism literature is the tourism area life cycle uh, by Butler in 1980. So uh, the argument here is over time, you'll start with an exploration stage of tourism where people are just kind of getting, figuring out what it is, starting to get involved, and then it'll go up and up with development. And then he argues that with more development, there's more negative impacts and then communities are often less involved at higher levels of tourism. Uh, since then, some researchers have argued that, yes, there's more negative impacts, but there's also more positive impacts as well. And in, in the majority of cases, a lot of people say that the benefits do outweigh the impacts, which brings in the social exchange theory. Some other research have also, researchers have also suggested that there should be a pre-development stage here before tourism actually happens, and that would work well in our communities. Uh, we kind of put them along along this graph here. So the highest level of tourism would be Indian Creek, where they do have some infrastructure there. Tourists come with some regularity. At the lower level, more of the exploration level would be Golden Stream, where they don't really have any infrastructure in place, but tourists do occasionally come in. 
And then Medina Bank, although they did have a few tourists before, they don't have anything right now, so they would probably be considered the pre-development stage. Um, and then a lot of uh, authors also argue that awareness is a big factor in these stages and their expectations are, are an important thing at the pre-development stages. So from that, we could argue that if they have more awareness of tourism, they'll have a more informed assessment of costs and benefits. So maybe they think that there's more benefits than costs, but if they're not well informed, that's that's really important to know. Um, but if they if they do have a, a good a good idea of what the costs and benefits are, then they could be in a better position to participate in tourism development. Uh, one quote that sums that up pretty well is making local communities aware of tourism could help them become agents in tourism development. So the awareness is a pretty crucial piece of it. And then we come back to the MOA model. Um, so based on the social exchange theory and, and our results, we have communities that are interested and they're motivated. Another parameter is, is there opportunity to participate in tourism? And as we mentioned with the tourism developments, there is opportunity, especially with Yashé wanting to engage these communities in tourism. And then the last parameter is ability, which refers to a lot of different factors. It could be awareness of what tourism is. It could be knowledge, skills, and technical ability to participate. It could also be the financial ability. Do they have the financial resources, which is often, it was stated in our, um, in our respondents, um, response to barriers that financial resources was a, um, a major barrier to participation. And so, um, our communities at this moment really lack the ability um, to engage in participation. But what, how do we remedy this when you have a community that's lacking the, the capacity to engage in, or to engage in tourism? Um, oftentimes partnerships become a strategy to implement sustainable tourism and, and enable these communities to participate within the process. Um, and so there's, um, there's literature that states that because uh, tourism engages all sectors or different sectors of society, it's really important to engage in partnerships with those different levels in those different sectors. But we're gonna really focus on non-governmental organizations because we have Yashé um, wanting to engage these communities. Um, and non-governmental organizations have a, um, are at a, a, a special position because they're closer to the grassroots level. They may already have, and Yashé does, a relationship, a working relationship with these communities. And they often serve as a bridge for communities, between communities in the public sector and communities in the private sector. And although partnerships take a lot of work, um, they're not always successful and there are definite concerns. They can contribute to linking communities um, to, to markets that they didn't previously have, um, to building community capacity and awareness. These are all things that ecotourism beliefs would like to do. Um, and creating new products and services and linkages for the communities. And uh, Trejos and Chiang say, however, emerging destination communities, as um, if you remember the tourism, tourism area life cycle, we have emerging destination communities. They're at the very beginning stages, um, are at a disadvantage in terms of skill, experience, and knowledge of the tourism industry, and therefore require institutional support for information, capacity building, and networking opportunities. And I think I forgot to mention the definition for partnership, but essentially um, bringing two parties together to share knowledge, information, and ideas and, and um, with the goal of ach achieving a, a, a common goal. But as you can imagine, when you create a partnership, if it's not the community that's just um, making its own decisions, this can, uh, this can affect the distribution of power. Um, sometimes you have organizations that come in, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of knowledge, and um, you find that the community is not participating because there's an imbalance of power. And so it's important to understand how participation power and the collaboration process are all interrelated. 
and Okasaki provides this community-based tourism model. It looks very similar to the other one, but it's different. <laughs> so don't let your brain go there. <laughs> um, and on the x-axis, we have the five um, step cyclical process, um, collaboration process established by Celine and Chavez. And on the y-axis, we have Arnstein's ladder of um, participation. So in incorpor incorporating uh, participation in power and control. And essentially this says, as the collaboration process progresses, participation and control um, increase. And as participation and control increase, the collaboration process will progress. Um, however, that's really up to the stakeholders to decide, like do the communities, are, are we giving power to the communities? Um, sometimes communities have internal power struggles and that might prevent them from participating. Um, and Okasaki provides this model um, she said it's very important to know where the communities are. This is a, this allows us to gauge the success of community-based tourism, to understand where we are on this model. So where are we? <laughs> Our communities represented by the One House are at the very beginning. They have not had any power, say, in this process. Um, essentially, we've been the only outreach to them, coming to them and conducting the survey. So we've heard a little bit of their ideas. And we're going to we're conveying those to Yashe, um, but this, they're at the very beginning. The, the, the collaboration hasn't even started. And so, not to go into all the steps of collaboration, but the very initial stages of collaboration really focus on establishing a common vision, um, identifying mutual benefits, identifying a common problem, and deciding that collective action is a way to resolve it. And so. Uh, this shared vision really becomes the glue of the partnership and hopefully provides a strong base and, and really defines the direction that we're going. Um, so shared visions can, you know, contribute to that partner, partnership or collaboration process, uh, which when you have a good collaboration process, participation and, and power and control will increase. And if you just look at the literature of you know, what, what are factors that contribute to success in collaboration, there's all types of ingredients. We don't know which um, order they go in and, and different ingredients or different success factors um, can exist in one situation and not exist in another. But shared vision and goals comes up very frequently. Um, in addition to mutual benefits, um, we also have at the bottom from Berkey's and for Courtney, stability, communication, and transparency. Okay, so now we're going to review all of that and show our recommendations. So to, to kind of bring it all, all together and make, make the links, we, we talked about the MOA framework, the motivation, opportunity, and ability, which are all important to have meaningful participation. And the better these three categories are, the better participation you can have in the higher level of it. So, and to have like a successful community-based tourism here. And so we found that, yes, they're motivated. They want tourism. They want a lot of tourism. They really want jobs. So they're definitely motivated to, to try to get tourists there. Opportunity is there. Tourism is growing in the region. It's likely going to come to those areas. But ability is what was really lacking. They weren't really aware of it, and they don't really have the capacity to work in it. So this is where you really need a partnership. You need to partner with someone that does have the ability where Yasha and Eco Tourism Police can come in. But to have a really good partnership, you need a good base. So the part of that is having a, a unified vision. So they're all kind of going in the right direction. And then based on that, we have a series of recommendations for Yasha. And once again, we think <coughs> we really admire Yasha's work. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with them, um, but this is a great undertaking and it's a really um, complicated web of relationships and will will take a lot of work. And so our first recommendation is to establish that strong base for partnership to further um, later down the road encourage meaningful participation. And um, like mentioned before, it involves establishing a common vision, determining mutual benefits, and really being transparent. We really think it's important for ecotourism beliefs to communicate um, the payment scheme and their intentions from the beginning, and that quite hasn't been communicated as of yet. 
And um, there's examples in literature, um, for example, in Brazil, um, in a community-based tourism um, operation, um, the common vision was really what kept the, the, um, the, the, the partnership together. And in other cases where there's been a, a top-down approach, and, and non-governmental um, organizations have established the vision without consulting the community, the community has um, um, responded feeling alienated, and then you see a failure of the project. And this doesn't mean it always fails, but in a lot of cases it does. And we really suggest that Yashe staff, permanent staff, because they have a lot of turnover, be the key persons that uh, establish this relationship because you need someone that you can trust and that you can build a relationship with. And then our second recommendation um, addresses their lack, uh, lack of capacity to participate. And to remedy that low capacity and increased community <coughs> participation, um, this really goes to providing community outreach programs and build tourism capacity such as um, skills, management skills, business skills, social skills, language skills, um, any of the barriers that they, they perceive that they may need help with. And uh, in an example in Nicaragua, um, community said that the NGO that worked with them, the most invaluable service that they provided in that partnership was the capacity building, that without that they would not be able to do, um, or would not be able to have a successful community-based tourism project. Nation number three, uh, they should en enable meaningful participation and they can do this by training community facilitators and participatory methods. A lot of times us researchers go in and we have our Western ways of doing things, but no one knows the community better than people in the community. So you can train a few of them in there in different methods, give them a different idea like focus groups or, or drawings and different things, and then they can modify that to work in the community. Um, and then you don't have a couple white girls from the U.S. going in and trying to do things there. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then the community members are probably more receptive to people that are in their own community. The number four is ensure the benefits of tourism outweigh the costs. And you can do this by monitoring perceptions over time. So as we saw with the talk, the area life cycle, perceptions do change over time. So you need to monitor over time. And then if you see that the costs are starting to rise, you can take action. and and do a management strategy that addresses that. Um, and then kind of be ahead of the game, which Yashe is, seems like they're doing, so. Mm -hmm. Good job, Yashe. <laughs> and just to kind of wrap this up and uh, compare the visions together, we really think there's a lot of potential for the visions. And granted, we can't create the common vision. Um, Yashe and the communities need to sit down and do it. And, and Yashe needs to recognize that each community has a different vision. Um, so they can't necessarily treat all communities as one. Um, but what we do, what we have recognized within our experience, and we don't we do have the data to reflect that the community values the environment. We didn't include it in this presentation. We have a community, commu these communities do value the environment. They want to protect the environment. Some of them see the connection between um, ecotourism um, and protection of the environment. And obviously, Yashe is a conservation-driven NGO, so we have that commonality, a match made in heaven. <laughs> um, and then the communities want a community-based tourism model of development, where it's either community or group-driven, and the distribution of benefits go to the community or the group. And Yashe wanted to promote, um, or wants to promote sustainable tourism development, so that also um, coincides. And the communities are looking for help from the outside, and Yeshe is wanting to engage these communities. Um, and even though, you know, just under half were, thought that the help should come from an NGO, um, Yeshe is in a position to help. Um, one thing that might be at odds with uh, the community vision is raising funding for protected area management. Although that's a long term vision, it has short term goals. In order to fund protected area management, you um, really need uh, reliable income and significant amount of income so you can pay your um, park rangers, for example. And uh, community-based tourism is a, can be a very slow process and might not have the profits that would that would be able to fund that. So that's something that they might want to think about. Almost there, guys. <laughs> I want to see smiles. <laughs> um, 
So just with any you know, experience doing research, especially in another country, cross-cultural research, we have some just words of wisdom to share. And one of them is to be flexible and, and, and patient. Um, we had uh, national elections. Um, we experienced flooding in communities where we showed up ready to do a, uh, uh, a workshop and found that unfortunately that the community was flooded and you know you just have to be really flexible and also um, even cultural elements um, like our clock works a little bit faster and <laughs> is more on time than their clock and but that's an opportunity to really enjoy where you are and so you embrace those moments while you wait if people haven't showed up to your meeting you know bring your book or get to know the community or get to know the nature around you and so we really feel blessed to have that opportunity to embrace those moments while we wait um, and establishing a common vision is very important and we started our project off with establishing those objectives so that Yashe and ourselves, we were all on the same page and we knew what we were working with. And that goes for our survey as well, when we were getting lost in questions, well, what are our objectives? Let's keep focused. And so objectives are really key to a, a successful project. Um, keeps everyone on the same page. And like we mentioned, working with uh, three Maya communities, two different languages, uh, and their words um, for tourism and tourists did not exist. Um, cruise ship tourism, we just really had to think out of the box and try any idea to make our uh, survey instrument work. And that really relied on the feedback from our local counterparts, and which we could have not done this without them. I'm sorry, I need to take a drink. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so they really helped us kind of gauge if our ideas would work in the field and we tested them out and you see the latter is an example of our visual likert scale where strongly agrees on top with the two checks strongly disagrees at the bottom and we had them point out where they felt on that scale and we have so much thanks to give we had a crazy amount of support to do all this uh, jen especially provided so much support both emotional and practical so thank you so much for everything <laughs> joe and andy our other advisors have provided a lot of great feedback and they're also helping us write a couple articles which will be great um to have those done and provide feedback for those uh yashe was incredible they helped us we couldn't have done it without them they helped introduce us to the communities and helped organize everything gave us feedback on on our survey and language help and cultural help so they were Huge. And our research assistants, especially, they went out and did a lot of the grunt work on the grounds. And we couldn't have done it without them. And all the communities were awesome letting us in, and they were super supportive. Our CLTL family, our actual family, our friends, future CLTL <laughs> students. We, so thank you, everybody. <laughs> and thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Pleasure to share this with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put a slideshow to go on in the background as we talk. Uh, so we have time for some questions. Um, so obviously, for you guys are going to be pretty objective with this project. According to the book, um, I'm not sure I was going to do this, but I'm curious what your um, personal uh, opinion is or thoughts are on the, the effects or whether good or bad of cruise tourism will be on tourism. Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Andy's actually done some. Oh. So, so Kaylin was asking what we thought our effects uh, or what we thought the effects of cruise sh ship tourism would be on the area. And so Andy here, one of our advisors, has actually done research in Belize on cruise tourism and has found that the benefits often don't kind of spread to the communities there. And there's a lot of research saying that a lot of the benefits don't don't spread there. So, and you know, it's it's telling that a lot of people want it there because they want jobs, but it's really important to have that awareness aspect that you know they might get taken advantage of there. 
And then just from like what we've heard, there was a, a cruise tourism meeting where they went to like consult with the community and ask if they could use the river there. And they actually got some audio so from that meeting. And there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of yelling and they're not doing it in a culturally sensitive way. It's, you know, it's a dude from Florida that <laughs> has land there. And then there's been cases where he like started to have a contract with the community and then he would like buy land there. So then he'd have his own private land. So it doesn't seem like it's being done in a good way. So I think... I think there's a way that it could be done well, where like benefits could be spread if they pay like an entrance fee or something to use a river, then that money could go to the community. But the chances of that happening, I think, are right. Slim. Especially the way Norwegian Cruise Lines is um, handling the situation, um, and just from those that have participated in the meeting, they've been very from the community perspective, they've been very offended. The community members that didn't participate in the meeting and just heard that there was this meeting and this big company came in and offered jobs feel like well gee our leadership just you know sent the jobs away um it, it could benefit the communities of norwegian cruise lines went about in a more responsible manner going off of that question have you thought of maybe any ways to balance the perceptions and desires of the community with long-term social and ecological impacts of you know the actual like um, cruise tourism industry um, that's where like a partnership with Yashe could really be effective and actually um, people from Yashe have actually the ones that you can be an advocate for the community here because they have a little more knowledge about, about what cruise tourism could bring and because they're more envir environmentally minded they can also help kind of mitigate some of the negative impacts that could be brought from it. So when you're going against a cruise line I think Yashe might have a bit more power there so they can kind of help kind of be a mediator with the community there. And, and how this project came about, like um, Lee, um, who's essentially our go-to guy, um, he, and he's the project or the protected area manager at Yashe. Um, he really was concerned about the community's lack of awareness and really saw Yashe fulfilling a role of uh, doing community outreach and awareness building campaigns. And so this, his impetus for suggesting this project was so that communities could be more informed. Two related things. To what extent are there people that live in those three communities that have had the benefit of living outside, mm -hmm. of maybe being a seaman working abroad or working in the U.S. or even working elsewhere in Belize to have more of a worldview? Yeah. And to what extent are there people from other parts of Belize or foreigners living in the communities and to what extent have these people from the communities been taken out by Yaxche to visit similar communities in Belize or neighboring countries? Because I think you could do everything yeah. you said, but if those people have never ha seen both success and failure to mm -hmm. learn from that, mm -hmm. any amount of, of training and any amount of facilitation, I'm concerned that without understanding what works and what doesn't work would be difficult. And then the other side with the, the people lived outside or if there's people mm -hmm. from outside living in communities, Almost always in these situations, what I've seen, it's the spark and ingenuity and capital of somebody who's gone outside or somebody from outside who's gone in mm -hmm. that's been the evangelist, that's brought mm -hmm. the idea and been the early adopter and the risk taker. And then some other people basically over a period of time get into it. Does that happen in all of these communities or are they operating in a some, total vacuum? To some extent, um, number one, the communities have a very rigid um, process of how you can actually live in their communities. So there's not much uh, variety as far as the people, the residents of the community are from that community. Um, in the demographics, we show that some people job out and they job out to Placencia usually. So they have interactions with tourists there. Placencia is probably the southernmost popular tourist destination, which is was north of where we were by a couple hours. And um, so there are the more insightful responses that we did receive from community members were those that had jobbed out and had seen you know, even or had idea of the construction of the cruise ship port or had interacted with tourists. Um, and so it's not that foreigners can necessarily move into these communities. They, they can, they can apply. I, I want to apply, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we have, we met, um, what was his name? He was associated with the church that has worked with Medina Bay for um, 10 years. Craig Brooks. Yeah, so Craig seemed to be kind of one of those guys that brought the idea into the community. 
or, um, and there may have been other people too, but he just showed up miraculously at one of our workshops. Mm -hmm. There's a strange white guy standing out the door. I thought <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> um, and he had shared that he had been working with them for a decade, suggesting that they adopt tourism. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few people that have worked with tourists before, so they were kind of more informed about that. But then part of our recommendations would be to do some sort of exchange where like maybe do a field trip to somewhere where tourism is more developed and they can talk to people there about what are the costs and, and benefits there and then do some sort of, and yeah, she might be able to facilitate an exchange to, to do that so they can kind of see it for themselves. And, and there, are, there are communities along the Southern Highway that are not too far away where you could take um, some community leaders or community members that are interested in this process and they could visit Big Falls where there's a zip line and uh, river tubing and, and restaurants and, and kind of talk to those community leaders and see what how, how they've been affected by tourism. Ruben. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering about you know the perception about tourism you mentioned that this community is very diverse you know, in terms of uh, ethnic and uh, the racial differences. But was there like a differences among these uh, different ethnic groups on their perception about tourism? Within the communities? Yeah, within the communities. There was, there was some diversity, but then like in Matina Bank, like 100% of people tend to, to agree or, or disagree with something, but then there there's definitely always um, variance within the community. We did test demographics against a lot of them and they were surprisingly, you know, the same, like men and women for the most part answered similarly on a lot of the questions. Yeah. So we, we were kind of surprised at how much diversity there wasn't there. Yeah, those stories didn't come out. The, the main story that came out was the exposure to tourism. And then we didn't get the opportunity, I mean, traveling through Belize and going on these awesome field trips that we had the opportunity to do, we did talk to other people from other cultures to kind of understand how tourism was developing in the rest of the country. Um, and tourism looks a little bit different in the rest of the country. So we had a little bit of an opportunity to you know, understand other people's perspectives, but for this work focusing within those communities. It was primarily from the Maya perspective. Kind of following up on this Mayan perspective, I have a question about the linguistic situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to talk about you mentioned um, language barrier on one of your slides about ability. Yeah. And I was, my question is kind of two part. One, um, is there any, are there any differences in the linguistic situation between communities, like the languages spoken mm -hmm. or bilingualism? And then two, are there any differences in the communities and how they perceive language barrier? the language as a barrier mm -hmm. to participation. Yeah. That was actually one of the few things that we saw a difference between genders, right? Yeah. It was it was women said that sure. language is more of a barrier than men uh -huh. were, which was really interesting. Are these primarily Mayan speaking communities or is there some bilingualism or uh, so the 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 younger generations that <laughs> have been, you know, through school, they learn English in school, they you know, for the first five years of life, they speak either Mopan or Kechi Maya. That's the, the main language. So if you go in the community and you see little toddlers, you know, you could sign to them. Usually they don't speak English. They learn English in school. The older generation that may have not had that exposure, um, you run into that language um, issue where they may not speak English. Um, Belizeans also speak Creole, which is kind of like a pidgin English. and um, so you also have communication in Creole as well. Yeah. But then like, so one community we worked with, almost everyone spoke Ketchy, and then the other one, it was more mixed. Ah, that's so some people, yeah. yeah. So it affect their perception of language as a barrier, do you think, or hard to say? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we got into that. Um, yeah. I, I we asked I, them what, the, what primary language they spoke. Yeah. That's not something that we looked at oh, yet. Was there, talk, like having your focus groups and talking to these people, um, was there any innovative ideas that the community people came up with that you're like, oh, that's kind of a little hanging fruit or that's something that mm -hmm. is, is maybe um, could happen in the short term? We did do a visioning exercise in our focus groups. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> And some communities even responded by doing it like kind of a participatory mapping exercise by drawing their community. We asked them to draw it as it is and then how they saw it and kind of try to connect the dots and see what was preventing them to getting to where they saw it and then what 
is can enable them to get to the their future vision right. and uh it, i think like the big barrier that people see is they have they have these really big visions of like even establishing a zip line which i don't know if i <laughs> agree with that but they have a lot to offer um as far as uh maybe like little ruins in the area and also um uh, natural um, features but the connection with uh, with funding is is really a big that seems to be a big barrier that they're unsure of how to overcome um, as far as low line fruits we we did ask them what activities they would be interested in or like what they thought their community had to offer and a lot of them mentioned like caving and birding yeah. and and different things like that so they're they're pretty aware of what a lot of them were aware of what tourists were interested in, like, they, oh, they want to come see the environment, they can go down the river. And so a lot of them said things like that, which would be pretty easy, like once you get, yeah. you know, the training to, you know, tour them through a cave and stuff like that. So those would be. And Indian Creek has four women's groups and they have various levels of already being able to engage in tourism. So there's definitely some like, you know, the, especially, um, for example, one women's group has a freezer and they have a space to have a restaurant. They want to have a restaurant at some point. They also have cooking skills and they've been trained in cooking. So instead of like adopting something completely different, a restaurant might be um, more the route to go, something more feasible at this moment. Yeah. And then you, sorry, you've had a question <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I thought um, that cultural form of jealousy within the individual communities was really interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering if you thought that maybe that impacted the responses between community, the community at all? Uh, yeah, if, if, if jealousy kind of goes between communities, like yeah, one community is jealous of the other. One, like maybe between yeah. multiple. Um, I feel like we didn't get that sense. Like when we when we heard jealousy come up, it was more about concerns of members of their community rising above the other. And you have a good story of someone getting a raise. Oh yeah, <laughs> at the at the spice farm in Golden Stream, they do hire a few people from the community there. And then um, so the the owner there, he's an expat, and he wanted to give someone a promotion and a raise. And then he wrote the employee wrote a letter to him asking to not get the promotion because he didn't want people to be jealous about it. So it's a pretty big thing within the community. And then like in Indian Creek with the women's groups, there's four of them and they're all doing the same thing. And there's some big jealousy and, and issues going on there. And I also think that's going to be a really big challenge for Yashe because they, they did the survey in three different communities and found that all three of them are interested. So how are they going to balance that and not show that they're showing favorites to one community and not the other. So I think that's going to be a major And they've, they've there. already had a challenge with balancing that just with food orders between four yeah. women's groups. The women's, pro women's groups provide catering and they don't necessarily understand that, um, you know, if yeah, Shea doesn't use them one time, it's not because they don't like them. Um, it's because they're trying to you know, go about this in an orderly manner. Or maybe the quality of the food wasn't good that one time. So there's a reason why they're not using that women's group. And it seemed more as a personal um, uh, insult, like, oh, yeah, Shay doesn't like us, and that's not fair because they're treating all the others better, and we should be treated equally. This should be, you know, a fair process, and 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 that involves a lot of communication too. Yeah, and it's it'll be a hurdle with having tourism. That's kind of like a market-based thing that's based on quality, but then these communities are really concerned about having that benefit spread. Right evenly so it's kind of contrasting in that way too so that'll be a big hurdle no more hands 